Good afternoon, everyone. If you would be seated, we're going to start our program. If everyone would please be seated. We're going to get started. everyone. We are elated and excited to be part of the Black History Program this afternoon. I am the Reverend Shonda Nicole Gladden, and the three of us are Soulful Expressions. We'll begin with an instrumental prelude uh, that we're entitling Sankofa, which means to go back and fetch it. It is to recall the historic legacy of what is, to frame and shape a future of becoming. And although your program says the second selection would be overjoyed, we've decided to do a tribute to Errol Garner and Ella Fitzgerald, and we'll be sharing a rendition of Misty. But for now, please listen to the instrumentalists as they share in and go play. Oh, my own. 
Would I wander through this wonderland alone, never knowing my right foot from my left, my hand from my glove? I'm too misty and too much in love. I am too misty. And too much in love. was absolutely beautiful. Let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Soulful Expressions, for being here this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tanya Walton Pratt, and I am the Chief Judge of the United States District Court for the Southern District of Indiana. And on behalf of our court and its Black History Month committee, I'd like to welcome everyone to our court's 23rd annual Black History Program. I want to begin by recognizing my colleagues who are in attendance today, Judge James Sweeney, and Judge Sweeney always sits in the back, even though we have chairs for him up front, <laughs> Judge J.P. Hanlon, this Judge Hanlon, Magistrate Judges Tim Baker, and his lovely wife is with him today, Magistrate Judge Deborah Lynch, Judges Richard Young, Sarah Evans Barker, and Jane Magnus Simpson are attending virtually, and I believe District Judge Sharon Johnson Coleman in the Northern District of Indiana is also on our Zoom today. Our Clerk of Court, Roger Sharp, is present. Uh, United States Probation Chief Dwight Wharton, who is what, is present. Somewhere, there he goes. United States Attorney for the Southern District of Indiana, Zachary Myers, is present. And our Chief Federal Defender of the Indiana Federal Community Defenders, Monica Foster, is present. So thank you guys for being here. We really appreciate it. The mission of our court is to provide fair and impartial justice, the delivery of equal justice under the law, and to treat everyone who appears before us with dignity and respect. Our court's participation in an annual Black History Program celebrates our diversity increases awareness and advances mutual respect and understanding of African American history, culture, and contribution. The program also offers one hour of free continuing legal, legal education, so lawyers, make sure you sign up for that. In the aftermath of the social justice unrest in America and the global pandemic that has been especially harsh on people of color, we are now in an era where many, including the Southern District of Indiana, are advancing initiatives that raise awareness and promote equity, diversity, and inclusion. As lawyers and judges, we are in a unique position to advance these principles. 
Racial representation in the legal spaces allows for differing, necessary perspectives and views. The legal profession, unfortunately, has a ways to go. All five of Indiana's current Supreme Court justices are white, and only one is a woman. Indiana's Court of Appeals, of the 15 judges, only one is black. And according to a 2020 American Bar Association study across the United States, approximately 5% of all lawyers are black, while black Americans account for 13% of the total population. So Black History Month is an opportunity to understand a part of America's history that goes beyond stories of racism and stories of slavery and instead spotlights black achievement. The Southern District of Indiana has this program every year, not just to promote diversity, but to celebrate diversity. When we celebrate our diversity, we are conveying the idea that diversity is beautiful. We are publicly honoring these men and women. We are telling wonderful stories in a way that makes us realize how black Americans have affected our lives, how our lives would not be the same if these people did not take risks to accomplish amazing things. We have this program because continued engagement with history helps us give context to the present. The more that we celebrate, the more we educate, and perhaps most importantly, Celebrating diversity and recognizing its beauty brings us together. It helps us to learn about people from different cultures and backgrounds and to understand that we are all connected and finding this connection unites us. I am very excited for today's program. I've known Jimmy McMillan his entire legal career and uh, he's getting older because it'll be 20 years this fall. <laughs> he was, he's been like my little brother. I've known him both as a colleague and as a friend. What impresses me most about Jimmy McMillan is his unwavering commitment to equality and diversity in the legal profession, even before his current position with Penske. Through his work and leadership roles in the legal profession, through his leadership roles in numerous bar associations, he has worked tirelessly his entire legal career to increase opportunities for minority attorneys through his personal mentorship for so many that I can't even count how many people tell me that Jimmy McMillan is my mentor. He has been a champion for the advancement of opportunities for young boys, young girls, young men, young women, old men, old women. And you can read about his accomplished legal career in the biography that's in your program. Having served as the senior corporate counsel for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway at IndyCar, Attorney McMillan became Chief Diversity Officer for Penske Entertainment Corporation in 2020. This was based in part on his consistent voice for diversity in a sport where diversity had been lacking. He leads Penske's race for equality and change, which includes expansion of its relationship with X NXG, Youth Motorsport Inc., which is a nonprofit that introduces minority youth to the sport of auto racing and encourages continued growth in the, in the sport. His own son, one of his twins, Lance, is a member of the program and is driving competitively, and uh, he hopes to one day race in the Indianapolis 500. Jimmy McMillan is infamous uh, to those who know him for his, the two major loves in his life. One is his family. He's the father of twin boys who are approaching teen age. Uh, he's a loving and supportive husband, He's a dutiful son whose mother lives in his household. And who, you can't help but love a man who loves his mother. His second love is for Harley motorcycles. I'm so very proud of all that you have accomplished. It is my great honor and privilege to present to some and to introduce to others my friend, my little brother, Jimmy McMillan, affectionately known as Tic Tac. <laughs> Thank you so much, Judge Pratt, uh, for the wonderful introduction. I want to thank both for expressing as a band for that beautiful rendition. Uh, we could have listened to you all this afternoon instead of me, and I think we would have had a much better time. Your voice is beautiful, uh, absolutely stellar. Yeah. Giving an honor to God 
for whom I believe all blessings flow. The Honorable Chief Justice Tanya Walton Pratt, distinguished members of the court, the court's outstanding administrative staff, my fellow attorneys, citizens, family, and friends. It is an incredible honor to have the opportunity to share this extremely important moment with each of you at the United States District Court of the Southern District of Indiana's 23rd annual Black History Month celebration. As a transplant from the city of Chicago and now extremely proud taxpaying citizen of Indianapolis, Indiana, this celebration of the history of the accomplishments of African Americans in the federal judiciary and legal community as a personal event sparks my mind, my heart, and stirs my soul. In this place, this court, where since the United States District Court for the Southern District of Indiana was established on April 21st, 1928, people that look like you and people that look like me have come seeking fairness. At these tables, in this court, where people that come from where you come from and people that come from where I come from have sat nervously in their seats, waiting and wondering if they would be treated equally. On this bench, this court, where all have come, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, or class, hoping, wishing, expecting, praying, demanding justice. Today, we certainly will celebrate and pay homage to what we as a society have accomplished, but this celebration would not be complete nor worthy if we also did not recognize the struggles, the challenges, and failures that African Americans have had to overcome so that a little black boy like me raised on the south side of Chicago in the wild hundreds have a chance to stand before you in this court as the Senior Corporate Counsel and Chief Diversity Officer of the home of the Indianapolis 500 mile race. How about that? But an important question lingers over this auspicious occasion, and it's the same question that's been asked so many times since the first slave ship landed in Jamestown, Virginia in August of 1619. A question that flows through the minds of so many African Americans, and that question is, do I belong here? I ask each of you, do I belong here? I ask it in my authentic voice as my true self, as a proud, intelligent, strong, hardworking, patriotic black man, do I belong here? I ask it on behalf of black mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, black homeowners, inmates, business owners, black teachers, preachers, doctors, black engineers, scientists, workers, farmers, politicians. I ask it on behalf of black lawyers and yes, black judges. I ask each of you, again. I belong here. Maybe thinking, <laughs> Mr. McMillan, Tic Tac, whatever Judge Pratt call you. <laughs> the answer is obvious. Of course, you belong here, fool. We invited you and we put your name on the program. But you may have missed my point. I misunderstood the question. I'm not asking for myself. I'm asking for those of you. I'm asking for those that may not get a chance. Those that you may not hear or eat with or party with or listen to or love or even understand. I stand here on their behalf asking and pleading based upon a historic record of fair, equal, and just question. As an African American with an invitation to come to this court and speak for those that have too often been denied a voice, do I belong? Your facial expressions betray your thoughts, even behind your mask. Some of you sit silent in your mind, screaming, is he serious? Lost his mind? 
Oh, no, actually, see, when I was in the first grade, they used to give me these logic and reasoning problems. And it went like this. Mary, Kyle, Jane, and Tyrone were all playing the game. Mary is wearing a blue shirt. Tom is wearing a blue shirt. Jane is wearing a blue shirt. And Tyrone is wearing a black shirt. And they would ask, please say you do not belong. Mother was a school teacher. She always like instructed me to reread the question twice before you give an answer. Well, I'm gonna reread it just in case you missed it. Just in case. It might be a trick question. Mary, Tom, and Jane and Tyrone are all playing the game. Mary is wearing a blue shirt. Tom is wearing a blue shirt. Jane is wearing a blue shirt. Tyrone's shirt is black. One of them. Question still asks me which one does not belong. Not a trick. Just a far too common truth in almost every professional gathering of lawyers, federal court judges that I've ever been in. One is not enough. I recall being a nervous lawyer at Barnes and Thornburg LLP coming to this court to attempt to settle my first federal court lawsuit. The marble floor, the sound of your shoes echoing in the high ceiling hallway, the artwork depicting um, peaceful garden scenes of well, I'm just going to say it was intimidating. Needless to say, I questioned if I was Tyrone and whether I belonged. But what answered that question for me in the affirmative was that thankfully on that day, I was not making black history, but walking in the footprints of black history. The magistrate judge on that case was the Honorable Judge Denise K. LaRue. Let me be clear, her identity as an African-American woman did not lead me to believe that I would somehow get an advantage on the matter. No. I walked down the hall to her chambers. What her identity as an African-American woman, however, did say was loudly and clearly, it answered the question that I, as an African-American lawyer, belong to. Here. Here. In court. Late Judge LaRue has served as a mentor to me as a law student and a lawyer. I knew her. She knew me. She cared about my development as an attorney. She saw me as a man, but she understood and respected me as a black man. I do not ask for favoritism based upon my race. But concepts of fairness, justice, and equality require respect for my history and understanding of my circumstance as a black man. The Judiciary Act of 1789 established the federal court system in the United States of America. It would take 148 years before an African American would be appointed as a federal court judge. 148 years. I say that statistic with admitted anger Frustration, confusion, shame, and pain. What happened in those 148 years that African Americans came to this court wondering if there would be someone here to hear their case that would understand and respect their culture, their history, their tradition, their upbringing, their slang, their religion, their children, their parents, their ways of doing business, their methods of survival, slavery, sharecropping, discrimination, racism, Systematic, implicit, explicit, and yes, it existed. For 148 years, my people came to the federal court in those places at those times when African Americans were even permitted to file a lawsuit. For 148 years, my people came to the federal courts and there was no Judge Denise K. LaRue, there was no Magistrate Judge Doris Pryor, there was no Chief Judge Tanya Walton Pratt, not here, not there, not anywhere in this land they call America land where the United States Constitution says until Judge William Hasty. William H. Hasty was born in Knoxville, Tennessee, the son of William Henry Hasty Sr. and Roberta Child. He graduated from Dunbar High School, 
a top academic school for black students, and attended Amherst College in Massachusetts, where he graduated first in his class. He went on to attend Harvard Law School, where he graduated in 1933. And from 1933 to 1937, Hasey served as assistant solicitor for the United States Department of the Interior, advising the agency on racial issues. He then established a joint law practice with his cousin, Charles Hamilton Houston. In 1937, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt appointed William H. Hasey to the District Court of the Virgin Islands, making Judge Hasey the first African-American federal court judge. The appointment was highly controversial. Democratic United States Senator William H. King of Utah, the then chairman of the United States Senate Committee on the Judiciary, called Judge Hasey's appointment a blunder. In 1939, Judge Hasey resigned from the court to become the dean of the Howard University School of Law. One of the students, one of his students, was a young man named Thurgood Marshall. During World War II, Hasty worked as a civilian aide to the United States Secretary of War, Henry Simpson, from 1940 to 1942. He vigorously advocated for the equal treatment of African Americans in the United States Army, eventually resigning from his position in 1943 in protest of the unequal facilities and distribution of assignments between white and black officers. However, 1946, President Harry S. Truman appointed Judge Hasey as the first African-American territorial governor of the Virgin Islands, a position in which he served from 1946 to 1949. And while the Senate was in recess, on October 21, 1949, President Truman appointed Governor Hasey to a newly statutorily created and authorized judicial seat on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Hasey become, became the first African American to serve as a federal appellate court judge. He was nominated by President Truman and confirmed by the Senate on July 19, 1950. He served as Chief Officer of the Judicial Conference of the United States from 1968 to 1971. He assumed senior status on May 31, 1971. He was the judge of the Temporary Emergency Court of Appeals from 1972 until his death in 1976. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy considered appointing Judge Hasey to succeed retiring United States Supreme Court Justice Charles Whitaker. But President Kennedy feared that an African-American Supreme Court appointment would face insurmountable opposition from Southern senators. Chief Justice Earl Warren was reportedly violently opposed to Hasty, as he believed that on issues other than civil rights, Hasty would be too conservative of a justice. Kennedy, fearing a potential loss of vote, instead appointed Justice Byron White. Judge Hasty struggled. His resignation from his position as a civilian aide as a result of a fight for civil rights on behalf of other African Americans the unwarranted resistance of senators to his appointment to the federal bench is an all too common story. The not so distant history of African American federal judicial appointments is replete with stories of recess appointments performed in open and admitted fear of failed Senate confirmations based upon inexplicable concern about an African American appointment political philosophy, ideology, liberal tendencies, their stance on civil rights, or perhaps stated another way and more plainly, whether a black judge will always take black folks' side. Not worry about whether white judges always take white folks' side. You don't have to say it. 148 years plus says it. The unnecessary battles and the endless barriers, the failures to appoint us when we were the most qualified, the politics, they say it loud and clear. It is perhaps the reason why so many of our best and brightest African-American lawyers have respectfully said no thank you when asked to apply for a seat on the bench. Historically, systematically, inherently, and intrinsically, we have always had to and still have to fight to establish that I as an African-American belong here in this court. Not a trick.
178 years. It would take 178 years from the establishment of the federal court system for then President Lyndon Johnson to nominate Thurgood Marshall to be the first African American to serve on the United States Supreme Court on June 13, 1967, following the retirement of Justice Tom C. Clark. He was confirmed on August 30, 1967. Justice Marshall served in the court for the next 24 years until his retirement in 1991. And President George W. Bush then nominated and the Senate confirmed Justice Clarence Thomas to be the second African American to serve on the United States Supreme Court. We don't even have time today to talk about the struggle. <laughs> they only gave me so much time. 195 years, 195 to take 195 years from the establishment of the federal court system for Judge Ann Claire Williams to be nominated on March 13, 1985 by then President Ronald Reagan to a newly created seat on the Northern District of Illinois. She was confer confirmed by the Senate on April 3, 1985, and her confirmation made her the first African-American woman appointed to serve on a district court on the Seventh Circuit. I had the great honor and privilege of meeting and being mentored by Judge Ann Claire Williams at every National Bar Association conference, every corporate council conference. She greeted me. She knew who I was. She cared. That meant something to me. I wish I could explain it, how much it means. When a federal judge tells someone at Barnes & Thornburg, I care about him. People ask me why was I there for 12 years and how was I able to survive when others were not because I had a whole lot of people that cared about me and they told them it mattered. On August 5th, 1999, President Bill Clinton nominated Judge Williams to fill a vacancy on the United States Court, United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit caused by the retirement of Judge Walter J. Cummings, Jr. Judge Williams was unanimously confirmed by the Senate on November 10, 1999, making her the first African-American on the Seventh Circuit and the third woman of color to serve on any United States Court of Appeals. She assumed senior status on June 5, 2017 and retired on January 16, 2018. 221 years. Glad I did well in math. Getting the big numbers. I'm not going to go into quadruple digits. 221 years, over two centuries from the creation of the federal court system. In 1789, our country's first African American president, Barack Obama, nominated Judge Tanya Walton Pratt on January 20, 2010, to fill a vacancy on the federal bench of the Southern District of Indiana, created by President Obama's appointment of Judge David Hamilton to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Pratt became the first African-American federal judge in the history of the state of Indiana. Her historic accomplishments continue, whereas on March 20th, 2021, Judge Pratt became the first African-American chief judge of the Southern District of Indiana. I love Chief Judge Pratt. I mean, I love her dearly. My beloved mentor, supporter, advocate, and legal den mother since I was a hood revolutionary in law school. I respect Chief Judge Pratt. We all honor and celebrate Judge Pratt as we should each and every single day. But it hurts me to tell you the truth today. That Judge Hasty, Justice Marshall, Justice Thomas, Judge Williams, and Chief Judge Pratt are not enough. Not enough for me or my people. Not enough for me to say that we belong here in this court. I take absolutely nothing away from Chief Judge Pratt's accomplishment. Nope. In fact, I believe she would agree that it is my duty to speak the truth. She expects me to tell it like it is. She knows my heart. She understands and respects me as a black man, her brother. On behalf of that queen and so many others, I must keep it all the way real with you. Only 238 out of 3,843 people that have served as federal court judges have been African-American in the history of this country. Do I belong here? You say I do. 
The Constitution says that I do, but history, history has not yet convinced me and my people. I'm speaking for people you have never seen. We as African Americans remain logically skeptical during this reactionary time of diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging, whatever words we're going to throw in to make the acronym longer, post our brother George Floyd's murder that things will change at the magnitude and the speed that they need to change. We remain critically such circumspect that history, American history, as it relates to the treatment of African Americans and our unwarranted struggles in this country will repeat itself. I wake up in the morning and I go to sleep at night, pissed off that somehow, some way, one of my 13-year-old twin boys, Lance or Xavier, will become a 47-year-old man and they will be standing in the same spot, in the same court, 34 years in the future, 266 years from the creation of the federal court system, asking the same question I ask, do I belong here? Because if I do, treat me like that. Why am I so animated? Because I'm a proud black man. I hear the voices of our black law students daily asking if I belong in law school. I hear the voices of our black high school students daily asking, do I belong in college? I see it in the tears of the eyes of black associates in the nation's largest law firms asking, will I ever make capital partner? I mentor incredible black lawyers that ask, do I belong on the bench? Why are we still asking the question whether we as African Americans don't? Why are we still asking the question as Americans, whether we as Americans belong in America? We still celebrate our black history today. That's in a way from what we've accomplished. But we will also celebrate We've got to celebrate. We must celebrate what our American future could be, must be, and will be. A future where everyone that is attending this Black History Month celebration takes it as their personal mission. Everything in their power to send a clear message through their actions that African Americans, your fellow citizens of the United States of America, belong here. All the time. Just got it last night. We do that. Well, before I end, I'll let me make you a few well intentioned suggestions on how we can get there, right? First, mentorship of African American students and lawyers, scholarship for African American students. Support for the development and promotion of African-American lawyers in their place of employment. African-American law clerks. IPS and charter school courtroom visits. Lots of U.S. Attorney's Office and Federal Public Defender Agency community information engagement programs that actually take place in the community. Because some of them are scared to come here. Diversity internship program, hiring African-American administrative court staff, the appointment of African-American federal magistrates. I heard there was an opening. The appointment of African-American district court judges. I heard there was an opening. The appointment of African-American appellate court judges. The appointment of an African-American female Supreme Court judge. I heard there was an opening and President Biden promised the country that his sister would get the job. I just want undeniable confirmation that I belong here. 
in this court. Today, we celebrate the black history of the United States District Court for the Southern District of Indiana. But as early as tomorrow, you don't have to wait till tomorrow. You got a whole lot of time left in the day. The sun's still up. You could do it today. I hope that we are all feverishly working to prepare for the celebration where an African American lawyer can stand before you and proclaim a proud celebration. That our history now validates that this place, this court, is where we as African Americans, Americans. Miller, what a powerful message for our celebration. We want to thank you for being our keynote speaker for the 23rd annual program. I mean, it was an honor to have you here, to have such a distinguished person here in front of us today. Uh, we wish you much success and wellness going forward. I also want to uh, extend thanks to Soulful Expression. Mr. Uh, Terrence Stanford, uh, excuse me, Sanford on the keys. <laughs> Mr. Richard Floyd on percussion. <laughs> and the Reverend Shonda Nicole Gladden on vocals. <laughs> A lot of power going in here today. I really love, love the program, love, love what you did for us today. To our guests and all program attendees, we thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's program. Uh, to, uh, I want to give a special thanks, I should say, to our judges, agency heads, and agencies. Big thanks to our sponsors, uh, United States District Court, United States Bankruptcy Court, uh, United States Probation Office, Office of the United States Attorney, Indiana Federal Community Defenders, Inc., and the United States Marshal Service for the Southern District of Indiana. Your continued commitment and support for this program goes a long way. We thank you. I think that's it. I think I, I, think I thanked everyone. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot a group. <laughs> Black History Month Committee, congratulations on another slam dunk powerful program. I won't make you stand. But I do want to thank you by name. So, T.L. Brown, Heather Butler, Terry Denny, Terry Giorgio, Evelyn Holland, Doria Lynch, Serlina Northern, Tasha Taylor, Nika Tompkins, Nell Smiley, Jordan Davidson, Nico Ratliff, and last but not least, Tracy, where's Tracy at? I don't want to embarrass you, Tracy. <laughs> Tracy. Tracy. Tracy is actually in the Black History Month Committee after serving for four years. We want to thank you for your insight and suggestions. <laughs> but more importantly, for putting up with us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to miss you, but we wish you the best. We really do. So we're going to keep the tradition and close the program out with the singing of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the song, it was written by Mr. James Weldon Johnson, 1899. It was set to music by his brother, Mr. John Rosamond Johnson, in 1900, 122 years ago, going strong. Now, out of an abundance of caution, we will not sing as a group today. However, we do ask that you stand and enjoy the vocals of the Reverend Shonda Nicole Gladden, uh, as well as the sounds of Soul for Expression with the singing of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Once again, we thank you for joining us, and the completion of this song will conclude today's program.
lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicings rise, high as the listening sky. Let it resound the loudest rolling sea. Sing our song full of the faith that the dark has taught us. Sing our song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on until victory is won. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with the steady beat, has not the weary feet come to the place for which our fathers died? We have come over a way that was pierced and watered. We have come treading a path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy path, till now we stand at last, where the bright gleam of our bright star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who hast brought us thus far on the way, Thou who hast by Thy might led us into the light, Keep us forever in Thy path, we pray. Let our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Let our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy head.